Dr. Daniel Serwer spent 40 years in public service, 21 of those as a member of the Foreign Service. During that time, he visited almost every part of the globe, but notably, he did a lot of work in the Balkans during the difficult years of the 1990s and the ensuing Dayton Accords. Today, he is one of the retired Foreign Service officer jack of all trades that we know so well. He teaches, writes, lectures, and continues to remain engaged on international issues that are closest to his heart. Before I invite Dr. Seward to the podium, let me make a quick comment about the year ahead. 2014 is a special year at APSA. The association is celebrating its 90th anniversary, as is the Foreign Service. We have great plans for the next 11 months, and we hope that you will all participate in them. Dr. Serwer's appearance today is part of our busy calendar of events in commemoration of our 90 year history, years of history and professionalism. Again, thank you for being here and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for that. Uh, kind introduction. It's truly an honor to be present at AFSA, which is the professional association and union of the Foreign Service. It's very much at the epicenter of the issues I deal with in writing the balance. As I'm going to say some harsh things about the State Department and USAID, and even suggest they be abolished in favor of a single unified foreign office. I'd like to emphasize from the first that I have enormous respect for the Foreign Service and the devotion of its officers to pursuing America's interests abroad. I feel the same way about the US military. But I don't think the Foreign Service is well served by the institutions that hire, pay, and deploy our diplomats and aid workers. And I don't think our military should have to fill in and make up for civilian deficiencies. Writing the balance is aimed at correcting these imbalances. But it doesn't start there. It starts with the sweep of American history, which has given our, our military a leading role in America's foreign affairs since at least the French and Indian War. I was explaining to somebody just before that I set out at one point to find out when the role, the strong role of the US military in our foreign policy originated. And uh, I thought it was a post-World War II phenomenon. And uh, I discovered that I was really very wrong. And that Rachel Maddow is wrong in the book Drift when she suggests that we drifted in a military direction. I don't think that's true at all. I think we started there. Americans think their, of their country as a peaceful one, would like it that way. But in fact, we've had troops deployed in conflict zones for more than a quarter of our history without counting wars against pirates and Native Americans. And we've had troops deployed in conflict zones every year since the fall of the Berlin Wall. With each of our wars, we've improved our technology and expanded our reach, becoming by the end of the 20th century the world's sole remaining superpower. We have a strong, well-exercised military arm for projecting power. It's so strong that it's reaching the point of diminishing returns Every additional dollar buys minuscule improvement in our military equipment. And if you don't believe this, there's a nice scholarly article by Dan Dresner that shows the diminishing returns from military investment. Our civilian capacities are much more limited. I'm afraid this was glaringly apparent in Iraq and Afghanistan, where state and AID struggled all too often fail to meet the requirements. It's also been glaringly apparent uh, during the Arab uprisings, which have not only caught our diplomats by surprise, they caught everybody by surprise, 
but left them puzzled as to what to do. This, in my view, is more important than ever before. The enemies who cause us problems today are not often states. Saddam Hussein's Iraq uh, fell quickly, as did the Taliban government in Afghanistan. We won those wars. We lost the peace after the wars. The main threats today come not from other strong states. I think there are precious few on the horizon, one being China, but it's really on quite a distant horizon. The threats don't come from other strong states, but rather from fragile, weak, and collapsing states. Not always the most fragile, not always the weakest, not always the fully collapsed ones, but still places in difficulty. National security, which has always been more than a military mission, now requires state-building capacities that I believe are sorely lacking in state and AID, and I'll talk about specifically what they're lacking. They've scrambled hard to meet the needs in Bosnia, Kosovo, South Sudan, Iraq, and Afghanistan. But they are not much better configured than when I arrived in Sarajevo for the first time in November of 1994, and I can assure you that I was not particularly well configured for the role. Some of you will be thinking, I hope, that that's okay because we never want to do this state-building stuff again, and that view has become more and more dominant in the foreign policy world, and is certainly quite strong in the White House today. It's not only my colleague Michael Mandelbaum, who's written very explicitly about the uselessness of the state-building project, who, who thinks that its time has come and gone. Each and every president since 1989 has also told himself that. And each and every one has discovered that it's far easier to go to war and kill enemies than it is to withdraw, leaving behind a collapsed state that will regenerate those enemies. George H.W. Bush into Somalia to feed people, and then finding that withdrawal was difficult, finally passed it off to the UN and was still at war in Somalia. Bosnia President Clinton saying we'd be out within a year, knowing full well that we couldn't be out within a year. It took us 10, but uh, at least we're not at war in Bosnia any longer. Uh, unless you're willing to fight on forever, longer than the long war, you need to be able to build capable states to protect their citizens reasonably well. I think we're discovering this very clearly in Yemen, where the drone war seems to have created more terrorists than is killed, at least many Yemen scholars think so. This is one of the reasons, of course, that President Obama has tried to avoid engagement in Syria. He knows that if he breaks it, he, he owns it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there won't be a necessity to rebuild the Syrian state after this is over. I've just come from a discussion of Syria with some Middle East experts. And even though everybody in Syria, opposition and regime, are agreed that the Syrian state should be preserved, it's becoming clearer and clearer that there won't be a lot of it left when this is over, especially if it continues for another couple of years. So there would be a state-building effort in Syria, whether we're responsible for it or not, and of course that means we will end up contributing to it with both money and people. The same is true in Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo and in Colombia where peace is threatening to break out after decades of war in both places. Colombian government is in a pretty good position to do its own rebuilding project in, in Colombia. That's not at all true in Eastern DRC. There are places that America can't avoid involvement. If North Korea collapses, and that is looking more likely than ever before, I think, or if Cuba collapses, we can't avoid engagement. Nor will we be able to stay aloof if Pakistan were to come apart Let's not even think about Iran. 
So my view is that we need to prepare for the day, not continue to delude ourselves that we'll never do it again. That's been the pattern in the past. Presidents don't want to prepare for this job. They assiduously avoid it. Then when it's necessary, they try to mobilize state DOD, USAID quickly to do it. It's done badly, so the next guy doesn't want to do it and doesn't want to prepare for it. But as much as I think it's important for us to have state building capabilities, I also have to admit that doing it post-war is not a good game. I teach post-war reconstruction and transition at Sykes. It's very difficult and it's very expensive as some of the people in this room know. Anticipation is much cheaper and better. What we need are foreign policy instruments ready to anticipate and take early action to prevent states from collapsing by initiating balanced reforms. It's interesting that we've been reasonably successful at allowing this to happen and even encouraging it to happen in Latin America and in East Asia. Both of those regions have moved pretty definitively in a more open democratic direction than they were 30 years ago. Brazil, Chile, South Korea, Indonesia, these are sterling examples of transitions that the United States nurtured, encouraged, at least allowed. That's what we failed to do effectively in the Arab world, with consequences that are now on the front pages every day, and I couldn't help but notice that the President, in his State of the Union message, pretty much dropped the pivot to Asia because he had too much in the Middle East to pivot to Asia. We failed to anticipate the revolution in Tunisia. That's no embarrassment. Everybody failed to anticipate it. In Libya, we failed to help the new regime establish a monopoly on the legitimate means of violence, a failure that cost us an ambassador and three of his colleagues, despite the fact that Libya, in my experience, and my experience includes two trips into Libya since the revolution, Libya is the friendliest Arab country to Americans I've ever been in. And Benghazi is the friendliest city to Americans that I've ever been in in the Arab world because Benghaziites understand perfectly well who saved them from Gaddafi. In Egypt, we've been inconstant at best, supporting whoever and whatever gains power. In Syria, we failed to support moderates only to see them displaced and replaced now by extremists. Let me try to be very specific about the things that I think are lacking in our current institutions. They're lacking the cap capacity to mobilize early action. They are highly reactive, very good at reaction and really, really bad at anticipation. They have no real system for reforming security services. It's true that we train militaries abroad. We're much less persistent and constant about training police abroad, but we train militaries abroad. But we don't train the civilians who have to provide oversight to the military. So you end up in Egypt, more than a billion dollars a year, somebody told me it averaged two billion dollars a year over the last several decades, of military equipment and training going into Egypt, and the Egyptian army essentially has learned nothing about democracy, but more importantly, the Egyptian institutions that should have oversight over the military simply don't exist. The third area where I think 
we have some good efforts, but they're nowhere near the scale they should be, nor are they, and they are, in my view, too much under the thumb of the State Department and USAID, and that's the area of promoting democracy. We have some superb instruments for it. NED, IRI, NDI, USIP, IFES, these are, these are fantastic instruments, but they are on a very short leash these days. Uh, to the government, and I don't think they're allowed to do all that they could do. Fourth area, surprisingly, that's lacking, or had been lacking, is countering violent extremism. When Dan Benjamin testified a few years ago in the Congress, uh, he was asked, well, what, what are you doing about countering violent extremism? And he said, well, there are 15 ambassadors around the world who have $100,000 each to counter violent extremists. Well, it, Dan essentially said to the committee something we all know he's never supposed to say. If you want to help us with a little bit more money, that would be quite welcome. Of course, he's supposed to defend the, the president's budget. Uh, the the uh, Obama administration has now moved to create a a, uh, an international fund for countering violent extremism, which I think is fundamentally well conceived, but still doesn't really exist. It's uh, in process. This is more than 10 years after 911. And the fifth area, I think, where we're deficient is in citizen and cultural diplomacy. Uh, I'll, I'll answer a question that hasn't been asked yet. Uh, wh why don't I talk about? about uh, public affairs. Well, I don't know what's wrong with our public affairs efforts. They're clearly failing in many respects. But I know that our citizen diplomacy efforts are just as clearly succeeding in many respects. And so I believe in strengthening uh, what you do well uh, and not continuing to hack away at what you do badly. And, uh, you know, if, if you look at uh, the Fulbright program, if you look at uh, the, the citizen diplomacy, diplomacy efforts like Sister Cities or any number of others, uh, these are successes. And frankly, when I travel abroad, uh, you know, even in very hostile countries, people are at great pains to tell me that they like Americans. They don't like American government policy. Well. I'd like to see a little bit more investment in citizen and cultural diplomacy as well. Uh, my colleague uh, in the service, Dick Art, wrote a book called uh, The First Resort of Kings about cultural diplomacy uh, in the American government and uh, published by Potomac Books, like mine. Uh, and it, uh, it really illustrates very clearly the awkwardness that the U.S. government feels with cultural diplomacy and its lack of wholehearted backing for it. What these areas have in common, mobilizing early action, reforming security services, promoting democracy, countering violent extremism, encouraging citizen and cultural diplomacy, what they have in common is that they're all at the margins of traditional diplomacy. They're all at the periphery. And I readily admit that the last three are better done mainly outside the government, while the first two, mobilizing early action, reforming security services, are more inherently governmental. But I don't think any of this can be done with our current institutions, which were designed for different purposes in other eras. Inertia and legacy are too strong. The way I know inertia and legacy are too strong is that People much more intelligent and capable and knowledgeable than I am have written for decades reports on how to reform these institutions. Uh, I, when I launched this book, it was with Tom Pickering, and I, I said to Tom, you were the one who convinced me that, uh, that reform was impossible. And the way he convinced me was by writing lots of intelligent reports about how the State Department and USAID should be reformed, and nothing ever happens. And I didn't want to continue hacking away at 
at that effort, I want to really offer you a thought experiment. If we were to design our institutions today for the challenges we know exist, which are mostly not state-to-state -state challenges, but state-to-citizen and citizen-to-citizen -citizen challenges, would we design something like USAID in the State Department? Well, part of the answer to that question lies in the origins of the State Department and USAID, a state uh, which was originally the Department of the State, the reason it, it has that name is that uh, the first Congress created a foreign office and decided it wouldn't have enough work to do and threw it in with all the domestic functions of the U.S. government, except for the Attorney General War and, and, uh, and Treasury. And uh, so the Department of State was the Department of the State. And, you know, it has uh, basically a 19th century architecture of, uh, of a foreign ministry. It's got most of its people abroad in well-established embassies, fixed in well-established embassies and missions. And uh, uh, it's got a, a very static architecture. And that architecture is largely attributable to legacy and inertia, not to current needs, which do not dictate where people go. Let me just to illustrate that point with my own experience as Deputy Chief of Mission in Rome. Rome, when I first got there in 1977, as the science officer, had 800 employees. It had 800 when I left in 1981. When I came back in 1987 as economic minister, it still had 800. When I left as DCM in 93, it only had 720 because the ambassador and I made a big effort to cut it back 10%, which was regarded as an enormous achievement at the time. But of course, my successors restored that personnel, and it now has 800 people again. This is over 40 years, almost 40 years, in which the government in Rome has delegated many of its sovereign functions to Brussels. There's been a communications and information revolution that enables you to do a lot of things from Washington, D.C. that you couldn't have done 40 years ago. It's 40 years in which the need for American bases in Italy has declined significantly because we have bases much farther east and south. Italy used to be the aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean and the farthest east and south we, we really got. And yet, still 800 people in Embassy Rome. And they're not 800 State Department officers. You all know that the vast bulk of them belong to other agencies. The number of state, the actual number needed to do the consular and diplomatic work of the United States in Rome, I calculated when I was DCM, the actual number was 32. There were 36 other agencies of the U.S. government in Rome. And most of our diplomatic personnel are, in fact, tied up servicing other agencies of the United States government. USAID was founded with a poverty alleviation and economic development mission to help fight the Cold War. Few of us still think the U.S. government can fix poverty issues at home, much less overseas. There have been an awful lot of proposals for reform. We should remember transformational diplomacy, the QDDR, which is a magnificent document in my view, and outlines very clearly what the new challenges are. But the QDDR was great conceptually and wrong bureaucratically. It didn't do anything to fix the problem. So I've concluded we need to rebuild from the ground up. At least we need to conduct a thought experiment of rebuilding from the ground up. I didn't attempt in the book a detailed design of a new foreign office. I think that's a job for many people, not for one. But I can think of very few reasons other than constituencies in Congress 
why there should be why USAID and the State Department should be separate. I don't. It's clearly duplicative, wasteful, and uh, and mildly ridiculous to tell you the truth. The Canadians recently folded their aid organization into their foreign ministry. The Brits are working hard to 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 combine their efforts better. They have a problem because they have a cabinet level um, aid person, and once you've got that, it's almost impossible to get rid of. We don't quite have that, so maybe we're not in that situation yet. I also think we need a much beefed up non-governmental effort. When it comes to promoting democracy, counting violent extremism, citizen diplomacy, these things, these are things that are best done outside the U.S. government and at arm's length from the U.S. government. And that's not the way these things are done today. If you talk to people in the democracy field especially, they'll tell you that they are more and more under the thumb of the U.S. government and frankly some pretty ridiculous requirements that come in part from the Congress for quantification of their impact. Um, I uh, confess to being a total <coughs> skeptic about quantification of their impact. Where would the resources come from for what I think is needed, which is a, a core of people who would be readily assignable wherever you needed them on extremely short notice? This core was actually created by President Bush, George W. Bush, who had mocked the idea as a candidate, but then found that he needed it as, as president, created the Civilian Response Corps. Hillary Clinton brought it up to a thousand people, and now it's essentially been, it's evaporating. Let's say there are very few people left in it. They're using a kind of sophisticated Rolodex system now to ring up people to assign them into, into uh, missions abroad that need people quickly. Well, that, that's fine. I mean, it's a cheap way out. But it's not going to give you the kind of well-trained, well-equipped, standing core of people who really know what they're doing. It's going to give you the one-offs. Uh, and it's not going to give you people who are trained to operate with U.S. military forces. Uh, where would we get the resources for a deployable core like that? Well, I think it's clear where we should get those resources. It's from these monstrously overblown embassies. It's not from canceling an F-22 or two, because everybody always proposes that, and, and nobody ever does it, and it's not going to happen. But those embassies, overblown embassies, are within the control of the Chiefs of Mission and the Secretary of State to shrink them. And those resources, what I would do is to consult with the Congress on shifting those resources. A lot of those resources are hidden, of course, in the domestic agencies in the U.S. government. You need to be able to shift those resources over to, uh, over to the State Department. What we need is a far more agile, anticipatory, and mobile foreign service, one built for a world, and this is an amazing fact, within our lifetimes, even though some of us like me are quite old, within our lifetimes, every single pe person on Earth will likely be connected to every other person on Earth via readily available and not very expensive communications. That's extraordinary. And we're going to continue with a 19th century architecture of, of our embassies in a world in which everybody can talk to everybody else. It doesn't make any sense. We need to build a new foreign service for that world, the one in which virtually everyone will soon be connected. And ordinary citizens are going to be counting for much more than ever before in world history. Let me stop there. I'm sure I've provoked a few people to want to uh, ask questions and make comments. At least I thought I was sure. Please. <laughs> uh, you're very 
sensing the need to be more anticipatory. And if, if I understand correctly, in 2002, before the invasion of Iraq, the State Department had for a year a think tank group that put together what the consequences might be on the ground after. Uh, but it was totally, apparently, ignored by DOD and so on. And went to not so the ability to do that is there, but how do you mobilize that to make it the impact of it when we, we have the resources in the State Department? Well, I think the State Department has fallen <coughs> on hard times. We may not realize that because it's still across the street. It has almost twice as many personnel as it had 10 years ago. It's, uh, it's thriving in some respects. But it's fallen on hard times in the sense that its capacity to be the go-to place for the White House has is evaporated so that this White House, more even than the George W. Bush White House, is thought to be ignoring the State Department. <clears throat> the, um, the Iraq study uh, was a brave effort, and I have not looked at it. But I'm assured by people who have that it was in no sense a real plan for what had to happen after, after the war. It had a lot of good material in it, a lot of good background material, but it was not something that was executable. And that's not surprising, because State Department people, as those of us who serve in the State Department know, don't like planning. We are quick reaction people. We are uh, people who want uh, to train our our youngsters by sink or swim. Throw them in the pool, see if they swim. Most of them do. Fish them out, give them a little training, but get them back in the pool as quick as you can. One of the contributions of SCRS, the conflict part of the State Department that is now CSO, uh, one of its big contributions was in fact providing some planning capability, because it doesn't exist. I mean, our, our missions generally will go through once a year a mission program plan, but very, I, I don't know of any serious capability in the State Department to design a major uh, reconstru uh, a reconstruction of even a medium-sized country. Uh, you know, if we had to do something like that, we'd have to do it very in very tight cooperation with the Defense Department. What happened uh, during the Bush administration was that the Defense Department was prohibited from cooperating with the State Department and, and then favored in the bureaucratic uh, backlog. Now, to the State Department's great good fortune, the Defense Department screwed it up. So Iraq will forever be remembered as a screw up by the Defense Department, not by some joint effort or by the State Department. And they can always point to the study that wasn't used. But I don't think we should delude ourselves that that, that, that study really uh, did what was needed at the time. Please, Phil, no. introduce yourself. I, I'm not making people introduce. There's so many distinguished people in the room that, am I supposed to do this? Yeah. <laughs> My name is Bill Farron. I was in the Foreign Service for 34 years. Uh, basically, what they call the economic cone, a system which I think ought to be scrapped, and we ought to find other ways of applying the considerable intellectual ability in this organization that we all love to participate with, and of course, uh, badly managed, it seems to me, all the time. But I have about a thousand things I can say to you. Uh, I was um, approached by Madeline Al when Madeline Albright was secretary by uh, one of her aides, a guy named Bill Montgomery, who was close to Larry Kissinger, uh, Larry uh, Eagleberg. Did I say Larry Kissinger? <laughs> Maybe I should go. But uh, I went off and did 
something in a, uh, I went off into a, a problem that was considered undoable uh, in, in Bosnia, bringing together uh, the Croats, the Muslims, and the, uh, the Serbs, uh, trying to get them to reconcile their differences, and if they couldn't forget the hate, which they couldn't and really haven't, to uh, where I'm going with this is there was nobody that I knew that I could go to to ask for advice as I headed off. I was run through the department, uh, with, as the department does when they do something like this to a single, they eat, they're talking heads all over the, the, the bureaucracy, I guess, in that 12 or 15 set. But there was no training program. There was no example. There was no, as the military does so well, they put together uh, military exercises that are going to bring them into, into contact when they get to the, as they call it, downrange. We don't do that. We don't have, nobody when I finished came, came back, approached me and said, how was it? How did it go? What did you learn? It was, it be yes. They got me to go along with exercises and play roles that were similar to the one that I did, but not the part I think we need that, but who will devote their time to take a tour to be a peace builder or a peace reconciler or whatever you want to call it? Well, look, uh, the situation is a little bit better today than it was for you and me, Bill. Bill went to Bridgeco and did a great job there building not a state, but a municipality. Uh, uh, and uh, he's described it in a wonderful book that uh, I make my students read the first chapter of because it's, it's such a good illustration of the problems that arise. Things are a little bit better than they were when you and I went out. I, I got this much instruction. I went to see Dick Holbrook, and he said, the Bosnian Federation, which was half of Bosnia, actually one-third of Bosnia during the war, he said, the Bosnian Federation is the best thing we've done in Bosnia in years. He said, make it work. Th those were my instructions. That yeah. was it. That was it. My well, I didn't even, I had no idea that I was being asked to build a state. But that's, you know, I kind of figured it out. They needed a defense ministry. They needed a foreign ministry. They needed, they needed everything. And uh, I tried to do it on a shoestring and had some significant success. And if I had a dollar for everybody who told me that the Federation would collapse, I'd be a very rich man. But the Federation persists to this day, unfortunately, as half of Bosnia. Uh, the point is that uh, things have not improved a whole lot. They were on a course to improving when Hillary Clinton was, was Secretary of State. They, she was building up this civilian response corps. There was going to be training. There were going to be exercises jointly with the US military. And it's all evaporated. Yeah. It's all evaporated, and we're now hiring people the way we hired for Iraq and Afghanistan, which was sort of, you, you walk in, you know somebody, you get hired. You, get assigned out there. The way, the way you were called, you were in Papua New Guinea, if I remember correctly, uh, when, when, when the department called you. This is no way to run a railroad. You can run a 19th century foreign ministry that way, but you can't run a really good railroad that way. Please. Hi, I'm Alex Tierski from the uh, Congressional Research Service. Um, I wonder if you would react to, um, I think, one of the critiques that I've heard of the kind of approach that you're advoc advocating. Uh, essentially, creating um, the Civilian Response Corps could be interpreted abroad as the United States essentially developing a standing occupation force. And I wonder if you could, if you could react to that. And, and, and a second question I would have is you, you've mentioned the QDDR, but you haven't mentioned the fact that we are launching towards the next one that is to be completed this year, uh, according to public pronouncements. If you could give us a sense of where you think that process is going. Thank you. 
The second question is easy. I have no idea at all what they're doing on the new QDDR. Uh, I'm mildly surprised they're bothering because the last one was not a brilliant success. It was a success intellectually, but it was it, it did not do anything like what its own text said needed to be done. Look, no matter what the United States does, there's going to be somebody abroad who interprets it in a way that's negative. Uh, but, you know, frankly, I think we have to ignore that. I don't think it will have much salience abroad in any case. I think, uh, you know, we have to build what we need for our purposes and uh, pursue our own interests. Uh, I hasten to add the Congressional Research Service, if you're at all affiliated with the fine reports of Nina Serafino on this subject, uh, they are really the best things available. Uh, the, the strange course of bureaucratic developments uh, on, on the question of uh, state building and, and uh, conflict prevention abroad, that kind of thing. So, introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Bill Harrop. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer and the president of this institution at one time. Uh, I have a kind of a, a, a building a little bit on, on the previous question about the American occupation notion. Uh, it seems to me that your whole construct is uh, takes the premise that the kind of the American empire is going to continue, that the United States has a not only the responsibility of maintaining peace around the world and building countries or uh, <coughs> preventing conflicts elsewhere, whether they actually directly affect us or not, a sort of international sheriff, but also that the United States has the capabilities, economic, political, military, perhaps military, you might argue that we do, uh, to do that. Now, I, I think it's pretty clear that Ambassador, that uh, President uh, Obama doesn't think that. This is why he is the private elected to go into Syria, why he was reluctant to go into Lib Libya. He feels that the United States has done a little bit too much expeditionary work that we've, uh, as you agree, sent the troops too often, but I think he would also uh, probably uh, shrink back a little bit from sending uh, all of the NGOs and the uh, uh, and the civilians that you recommend too. In other words, is the United States, are we going to have a Pax Americana for the indefinite future, or is it perhaps time for the United States to withdraw back to itself a bit, and unless a situation threatens us, perhaps not feel that we're responsible for correcting it? I do think that retrenchment is the word of the day. Richard Haas advocates it, thinks it's a pretty policy. Uh, I think it's a necessary policy. I think there will be retrenchment. I think it has some pretty ugly consequences. It has ugly consequences in Syria. It has ugly consequences in a lot of other parts of the world. But it's going to happen. And in the book, I don't assume that the United States has to do everything. I did talk more about the United States today because it's a State Department audience, basically. But uh, I don't think the United States has to always do these things. I think we need to build international institutions that are also capable. And we have some very good ones. The UN is very good at certain things. I'm always, I always marvel at the fact that some things are done extraordinarily well in the international community, and other things totally incompetently. The extraordinarily well category is led, in my view, by the elections apparatus. We can conduct an election any place on Earth a year from now. It doesn't matter how messed up the country is. It may not be a beautiful election. But IFES, NDI, IRI, UN election unit, they'll all go in there and they will set up a higher electoral commission and they'll, they'll, they'll make an election happen even in South Sudan. They, they literally did do that. OSCE, 
an extraordinary organization has played very useful roles. Uh, I don't think we have to do it all. In fact, quite to the contrary, almost all operations, even those that we think of as unilateral, like Iraq. I remember going to the defect in Baghdad for the first time under the uh, under the uh, under Bremer's rule and uh, the Coalition Provisional Authority. And I sat down and strange uniform on the guy across from me. It's a Dutch soldier. Uh, there were a lot of non-Americans involved in the Coalition Provisional Authority, and almost none of our unilateral operations are truly unilateral, only killing Osama bin Laden or something like that. We are weary. We're a weary policeman, according to some of my colleagues at SICE. And I think we're entitled to be weary, and we're entitled to retrench and defend our own interests more explicitly than sometimes in the past. But we also have to be ready to be a global fireman. There are fires that you can't allow to burn without expecting them to eventually get us as well. Syria is becoming one of those fires. And we're going to have to, within the next year or so, I would imagine, we're going to have to reevaluate whether the destruction of, of, of the state structure in the Levant is really a matter of indifference to the United States. So yes, retrench. Part of the game is figuring out how to get other people to do what you want them to do. I don't think, you know, one of Bill's great virtues is that he proved that in Bridgeco you can do a hell of a lot without money. He didn't have any money. They'd spent 200 million Deutschmarks. The Euro European Union had spent 200 million Deutschmarks in a town called Mostar, just a couple hundred miles away, maybe not even that far away. And they achieved nothing. Bill had <coughs> minor resources, but with cleverness, good use of the US military, uh, he, he, he managed to put something together that the Bosnians own enough so that it's continued to persist despite some considerable strengths. So I don't think we have to do it all. I think we should be doing things cooperatively, as we always have. Europeans paid for 90% of the Balkans intervention. The, the, the first Iraq war was pretty much 100% paid for by other countries. Uh, we do have to share burdens. I'll give you one more example that I have illustrated amply in an article in Survival this month. The Strait of Hormuz. We spent close to $100 billion on military means to protect the Strait of Hormuz every year. It's an amazing number, but that's the number Rand came up with, close to $100 billion. So it's there are other numbers that are much, much higher, but th that's the sort of conservative number. <coughs> what happens when you send an American minesweeper to protect your roofs? The price of oil goes up, not down. And what you're trying to do, protecting her moves, is to keep the price of oil from shooting up. Are there other means by which we can protect her moves other than, other than military means? The answer is yes, there are other means. One of them we use, that's the IEA early stock draw uh, agreements. But until very recently, we weren't encouraging India and China to up their reserves so that they could join an early stock draw. That's crazy. They're the ones getting oil from whom was, we get very little through whom was. 10%, 15% of the total to who most Chinese get half of it. And we, we should draw down our stocks when Hormuz is cut off. But there are other things too. There are pipelines that should be built around Hormuz. Some have been built. The ones that exist aren't used to full capacity because you have to spend a couple hundred million dollars more for, for anti-friction agents to 
allow the, the, the capacity to be increased. These are diplomatic thing, things that could be accomplished by diplomatic means that would lighten our military burdens. And that really don't cost anything. They're, they're a question of getting other people to do the things you want them to do. And I wouldn't retrench so far that we're not doing those things. Well, one more thing, Dan, on the retrench is the word you keep using, but the, uh, if the, uh, as, long, as long as the Chinese say and the Europeans can be confident that the United States will be responsible for problems around the world, uh, why should they spend money on doing it? If the United States feels it's an American, that the world is a global American empire and behaves that way, uh, why look at the proportion that the Europeans spend on, uh, on their defense capabilities. Look at the interest the Chinese have in international stability. You know, but it, as long as we keep behaving as though the world is our responsibility, I think it's going to be unlikely that others will step in and share the burden. Well, I agree with that to some degree. And uh, my final proposal for Hormuz is actually to invite the Chinese into a multilateral force to help protect Hormuz. Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to take on that responsibility almost entirely to ourselves. And you're right, as long as we're willing to do it, why would the Chinese step in? But the Chinese patrol for pirates outside the Strait of Hormuz, why shouldn't what would we fear? I, I don't want to turn over Hormuz to the Chinese, but if there were a multinational force, the odds of the Iranians acting in any way against the Chinese who take 50% of their oil is zero. They're not going to do that. So I want the Chinese in on this. And yet American policy has essentially been Carter Doctrine. We protect Hormuz. But that's a very primitive version of the Carter Doctrine. If you read what Carter actually said, he said we need to use diplomatic as well as military means. Does anybody remember why he issued the, the Carter Doctrine? Why we said we would protect Hormuz? It wasn't against the Iranians. It was because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which we saw as a thrust towards the Middle East. Give you an idea of how antiquated that unilateral policy. And it's not how much I agree with you. As long as we're doing it all, why should anybody else step up? But I think, you know, that should be very much part of our diplomacy now. As we withdraw, we should be working with others to see what they want to fill in. There's no avoiding the fact that if North Korea collapses, We've got a big problem on our hands. The whole world has a big problem on its hands. Then we should be planning for it. I, I don't actually know in that case whether we are or not. Other questions? Please. By way of planning, this is Rob Keller, uh, FSO, retired. Uh, planning for these things, I remember some time ago walking down, I think it was the sixth floor, one of the corridors, and getting pulled into a room and, and said, Rob, would you please join this, this group? We're trying to figure out what the hot spots of the world are that might erupt. Well, as you understand, my credentials, of course, were I was at FSO. I didn't have to know anything. I, I think that year I was an international economist. I forget. I'm a consular officer. But, uh, you know, very hard to pick out what's going to happen. You know, you, you recall we, we missed the collapse of the Soviet Union and all the money we had to put into there. And Tunisia is, is but one of the latest ones. I, I was also, at another time, working up with the UN when they were establishing the Peace Building Commission with the theory that we need to work with countries that are just coming out of a war because otherwise there's a very good chance, like 50-50, that within 10 years, they're going to be back into a war. Is that a good way to aim it instead, just to simply to try to fix up the countries that, that have had troubles like that? Well, I'm all for prevention. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we got to get better at prevention. On your first point, 
Uh, yes, it's very difficult to predict where trouble will occur. Mm -hmm. But frankly, there are people who've been working on this problem now for several decades mm -hmm. and who have very good statistical methods and done a lot of regression analysis. Mm -hmm. I saw a map the other day of uh, likelihood of coups in various places. I don't know how good that guy's track record is. There's a magnificent, uh, some magnificent work on the likelihood of mass atrocity uh, that's done by somebody named uh, Harf. Uh, a lot of this work is paid for by the Defense Department, by the way, which shows a lot of interest in looking quantitatively at where risks might arise. Uh, and they have the money to do it. And they have the money to do it. And more power to them. Does anybody in the State Department follow what these various indices show? Well, yes. In CSO, there are a few people who, who do follow that kind of thing. But does it have a real impact on the State Department's planning and in operations? The answer is no. And there is no planning capability in the State Department to speak of. Uh, there's, a, there's a policy planning group that you can find very intelligent people, but there is no institutional planning to speak of. And even the QDDR, what it was good at was looking at what what the situation in the world was. It wasn't very good at looking at how we might respond, how we might plan to respond. So I think, I think we have to get better at that. And this sink or swim, bring in the guy from the hall, you know, sure. see what he thinks, I mean, it betrays a very lackadaisical attitude towards mm -hmm. the planning and policy functions. Are we are we at the end of our time? I actually forgot to. Yeah, I think I think we'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that.